Hi, Smart Community friends, and hello to our listeners in Auckland, New Zealand. You are amongst this month's top cities for episode downloads. I'm back with another bonus episode of the Smart Community Podcast, sharing various guest answers to the question, where to next for smart cities and communities? And this time I'm sharing with you the answers from these guests. Alex Gluhack from episode 286, Natalia Kresiak from episode 287, Fiona Barden from episode 288, and finally Ellie Davison from episode 289. Some themes that come through in the guest answers are around knowledge sharing, standardisation, inclusion, diversity, and First Nations representation in Australian communities. We need to bring everyone along in this smart community journey to design communities for everybody and by everybody. As Natalia says, diverse voices in our communities is what should be next. I think many of the solutions we already have. It's just about bringing everybody together, bringing the perspectives together and enabling empowerment of communities. As always, we hope you enjoy listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. Welcome to the smart community, smart regions, smart towns, and smart cities. It's where we live, work, and play with smart communities. The future starts today. Big data, smart mobility, emerging trends galore. The Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for. So where to next for smart cities and communities? Well, <laughs> so I think the, the sort of, if I, if I say one keyword, it's sort of scaling up, right? Because I think we've seen now lots of small examples emerging all across different cities. And obviously, while this is good, you end up with quite sort of, I would say, solutions that are not necessarily very easily replicable and often also people trying to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> so I think... What we need are like more sharing of experiences that really actually work across cities and communities. But also then what we need is to bring in some level of standardization, I call it, or normalization, where solutions can be easier drag and dropped into different cities, right? And what I'm meaning is like one issue is obviously the city vendor lock-in, right? So, you know, you've seen this like for the last decade, you had Barcelona with Cisco, you had uh, another city with Microsoft, another city with uh, buying proprietary vendor solutions and stacks, right? And obviously, you couldn't really very easily then deploy a new service on top, or if a city decided to switch vendor, they had to rip everything out, put something new in. So that's obviously the issue of overcoming city vendor lock. For this, you need common standards, best practices, you know, that vendors need to follow. And that's the only way to create interchangeable solutions and choice and competition, right? That's one thing. The other thing is obviously the other side of the coin, right? Which I call uh, overcoming developer city lock-in. And developer, I mean software developer or solution provider. So basically, for instance, like take an example, city mapper which is like a very kind of popular uh, transport app here in the UK and I guess in other places as well, they would basically provide a transport app to get you around the city and you will integrate real-time data from a lot of different transport, local transport operators. But every city for them is a sort of new environment. It's a new market, right, in the end. So because they need to negotiate access to new data streams, they need to harmonize the, the sort of data so uh, or adapt their application to to use these new data streams or new data formats, right? Uh, there's some standardization here, don't get me wrong, but, but it's not enough. And so if, however, all the standards were the same and all the APIs were the same and negotiating access for a few clicks by signing agreements, whatever online, you can suddenly much rapidly roll out this, this service across many cities. And this is where we need to get to if you really want to have these economies of scale and actually to allow startups or companies to actually make a living. <laughs> uh, and so one sort of initiative that I'm sort of closely associated with is called Open and Azure Smart Cities. And they are leading the way on what we call minimum interoperability mechanisms uh, to really decrease this dependence on city vendor lock-in and developer city lock -in. And you can see now more and more cities starting to adopt the same principles, the same APIs, the same data models 
in the procurements. And that will make a big difference in basically how solutions are being adopted in the future. Yeah, I think that's really important. And like, it's a great example there that we can kind of all relate to as well. But thinking about all the other different examples that maybe not, you know, that's like customer facing, right? And so there's so many other examples that are like B2B or or government to be and, and that type of thing that is really interesting. And I think like open data policies and things like that can really help and be working with local government and, and researching with them as well. And there's so much potential in there if we have those standards in place and that work for people as well. And again, not a super sexy topic, but I think it's really important to standardize where we can. We know that every community is different, every context is different, but actually there's these common things that you know every city has every community has so if you can standardize those and nearly automate those in some kind of fashion then we can play at the top with these other more exciting i think the other stuff is exciting too don't get me wrong (laughs) i love standards and i love assets and and all that type of stuff as well but then you can actually build on that like you said those kind of things that the customer, the community really, really cares about and it's fun and exciting and interesting because those other things are taken care of at the basic level. Exactly, yeah. yeah I, think, I think it's a good point that you make. So by sort of like taking away some of the pain at the bottom, you can become more creative or more like, yeah, you can focus on what makes a real difference to your community, right? And I think that's sort of like, the, yeah, keep on here. Where to next for smart cities and communities? Where to next? I think uh, probably continuing, you know, a search for diverse voices in our communities is is where it should be next. I think many of the solutions we already have, it's just about bringing everybody together, bringing the perspectives together and enabling sort of that empowerment of communities, so grassroots movements in order for these things to actually happen. I think, you know, we certainly have a lot of uptake when it comes to smart design and smart communities from various organisations. The concept of what a smart community might be, I think, is very much taken up by a lot of people in Australia. The problem is actually doing the action and making it happen. That's where we get a little bit stuck and that's where it's quite hard because when you you approach a council and you say, do you want to create a child-friendly community? Of course, the answer will be yes, we would love to. But when it comes to actually doing it, that's when it becomes, um, you know, that's when it becomes harder. So looking at grassroots movements, enabling people to actually start that change. A great example of that, which I love, is from Belgium, where every year they have a play day. And on that day, children are not allowed to receive any homework from school. All of the children's channels on TV are blacked out. And kids and everyone is encouraged to get out onto their streets, shut down the streets to local traffic, and just you know, socialize and play outdoors. And all of a sudden that creates this normality around people using their environments outside to connect and to play. And it's a really simple way of communities actually then experiencing what a great neighborhood might be like and then asking for it in turn when it comes to planning and decision making. So enabling community empowerment, I think, is really important for that. Uh, And hopefully these sort of trends can continue forward. Hmm. Yeah, I really like that. And I think giving people a taste of what it could be because, you know, we often talk and Smart City definitely was this kind of utopian, oh, this is what it could be like or whatever, but there was no examples of it, Whereas, in, which is why I talk about more smart communities because we know what a community is. We know, um, you know, it's about social fabric. It's about all these other things. It's not just about technology and data, but we also know that technology and data are affecting our lives right now. So we need more people to get involved, understand that so we can use it for a positive and not let it happen to us. But I think, yeah, give people like, you know, it's not just their imagination then. It's like, oh, we've actually experienced it. Wasn't that great? You know, they, similar things with pedestrianizing certain areas or whatever, or, or kind of like outdoor malls or whatever. Oh, we'll just try it for the weekend. Let's see what it's like. And then getting the feedback as well is really important. Definitely. Yep. Well, where to next for smart communities? So probably like if I was thinking about what smart communities is to us, then I would Mm -hmm. suggest like inclusion across regional communities probably. So it's quite easy sometimes to see the difference between like metro, regional, rural and then remote. And so an understanding around that there's different 
ways that smart communities get expressed in each of those regions or those kind of groupings. So we're quite lucky we're a regional city, so we do have a lot of services here and things. My son's just started teaching in a very rural community. It's not remote because it's close and like three and a half hours away from here, but it's a very rural community. There's not many services and things like that. So I guess it's about how do we create those smart communities that are relevant to those different levels of need and also delivery so that, you know, it's relevant to the people that are there. And I think, you know, as I said right at the beginning, that's probably one of the first conversations I had with you was around the relevance to the people, not just here's the widget, roll it out, but what is it that this community needs? So I think it might not be new, but I think that's probably a really good concentration to try and understand those differences across different people. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Speaking of technology, my AirPods have just died. Hopefully you can still hear me. Yeah, I can hear. I can (laughs) Excellent. I think that's such a great example because, and and obviously something we talk about um, a lot on the podcast is that those solutions will look very different in each of those areas. But when we talk about smart communities over smart cities, then we can actually have some of those real conversations. So, yeah, no, it's really important. For sure. So where to next for smart communities? Yeah, look, I think that for me, it's, you know, coming back to really understanding like how First Nations people want to be seen and represented in our future communities. Like I'm working on a project at the moment and it's um, for a piece of uh, infrastructure. And one of the things that we talk about in the kind of look and feel of the stations and like how people are you know want to be represented and like they're talking about using things like technology for potential like virtual smoking ceremonies or ways that you could use qr codes to uh i suppose provide a platform for truth telling about the impact of colonization on their mob and they also you know want to use like storytelling through technology in the actual user experience of that piece of transport so you know it's a really interesting way to think about and I I feel like First Nations people are thinking about you know how could this project be used as a way to kind of recreate a really sacred journey and help to I suppose share knowledge to future generations so there's a lot of intent and interest from First Nations communities about how we can harness technology to share culture, to revive culture, to pass it down to the future generations as well as to the broader community. So I think, you know, for me, it's about a First Nations-led response to how they want their culture embedded into these future places, spaces, transport projects, and what they really want to see celebrated, harnessing things that technology affords us. So I think it's a pretty exciting space to be thinking about and there is a genuine interest and capacity and engagement amongst First Nations people about what that looks like in in the future. So I think it's pretty exciting to think about. I suppose the other thing that I do want to note as well, like I do some work with remote or regional communities and I suppose the big gap that I see is lack of technology reception their inability to kind of engage in the same way as what urban Aboriginal communities can. And, you know, that really breaks my heart, the disparity between people's experiences. And obviously there is a choice in wanting to like stay on country and be in these more regional or remote locations. But I also see that, you know, a bigger divide is being created because of how quickly things are evolving in urban landscapes. So I suppose I also just want us to make sure that we're thinking about those regional and remote communities as well and that they're not locked out of being able to participate in the same way as urban communities. Yeah, I think that's such an important point, you know, particularly during COVID and, and actually before that, but for some, for, for a lot of people, it, it became quite stark and apparent that connectivity piece has to be this like human right piece, right? Like it's like, you know, it's a utility, it's, it's the same, you know, electricity and water, shelter, those type of things, because how do we get our information? How can we participate in, in contemporary society, that type of thing as well. And then being able to shift it, like choose when you can connect as well, I think is important that we don't have to be on 
all of the time that we can choose when we are connected to outside world, but also then we can use the technology that when we need it as a tool. And so, you know, thanks for bringing that up because I think that digital divide piece, we did talk a lot about, you know, I had a lot of people on the podcast and we continue to talk about it, but I think we need to continue to bring that up um, so we can focus in and really make sure that we, yeah, like, you know, if you go to a community and be like, oh, hey, how would you use an autonomous vehicle? Wouldn't that be great? They're going to laugh you out of the town. Like, they're like, I can't even, like, connect, you know, I can't even call for my parents because I have to, you know, I don't have internet phone reception in, in my house or whatever the case is. So how do we really focus and make sure? And, and different solutions will work for different communities as well. And if there's a real focus on it, can we actually close that digital divide in a real way? The Smart Community Podcast is brought to you by My Smart Community. If you're looking for support in podcast strategy and production, workshop design and facilitation, or communication and media advisory, get in touch. Email hello at mysmart.community or head to www.mysmart.community. Thanks so much for listening to the Smart Community Podcast. Show notes for this episode and all other episodes are available on our website, mysmart.community slash podcast. If you have any questions for us or any of our guests, you can email hello at mysmart.community. You can also find us on the socials. We are on LinkedIn and Twitter at smartcomhq. That's com with two M's. If you are enjoying the podcast, please hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. And we would love for you to leave us a rating and review at wherever you listen. This really helps us reach more ears and eyes. So thank you for your support. As always, we hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for.